pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the beautiful morning you've given to us, and thank you for bringing us all out and for allowing us to be here today. I want to thank you for our church and for everything uh, you've blessed us with. And this next week, we want to thank you. Uh, I pray you'll bless our next week and just remember the sacrifice our Savior went sure. through for us and for him conquering death for us and so we can have eternal life. Pray you'll forgive us for our sins and give us a good day today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Anybody have a birthday this week?
Okay, how y'all doing this morning? Doing well. Everybody doing good. Good, good, good. Uh, Bethany, you got visitors? You got visitors? Yes, it's on the very end, my sister, my mom, and my dad. Sister, mom, and dad. It's good to see y'all. Y'all have been here before, right? Have you been here before with me? Good, good, good. What's your name? Okay, Bethany and Bethany. That's not be good. Uh, all right, good, good. Glad y'all came. Anybody else? All right, that is good. Uh, do you know what? Man, there's a lot of traffic up here this morning. Do you know what is what the significance is? Let me let me start again. How can you tell the donkey that Jesus Christ rode into? Jerusalem on the What's special about that donkey? How can you look at a donkey today and say, right there is a donkey that Jesus Christ rode into Jerusalem on? The cross on their back. The cross on their back. That's exactly right. The cross on their back. How many of you have seen one of those Jesus donkeys with the cross on its back? Is that all? No, they're kidding. Well, you need to kind of pay attention. They're not everywhere. But every now and then you'll be going down a road and they're small. I mean, they're like this tall. You know, it's not like it's a big animal. Do uh, you see donkeys frequently? Well, I guess it's a big animal. It's what they call frequently, occasionally. Yeah, yeah, every now and then. As a matter of fact, me and Patty saw it just the other day. I don't remember where it was, but we was going up the road and we saw it. Uh, and we, it's, we actually saw it. We didn't imagine it. We, we truly saw it. Uh, okay. Uh, next thing, I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, everybody have a good week? Everything going? Oh, I know what I was going to say. Mike, how many years? 42 years. Eight. how many years for you? Next month will be one year. All right, Mike, here is an opportunity for you to, here's an opportunity for you to, uh, dispense some wisdom to these young people about how it is that you stay married for 43 years. You got anything? Well, I'm sorry, 42. Okay, 42. You got anything? Nothing you want to tell Ethan? Best thing I can tell you, son, is just hang in there. <laughs> just hang with it. All right? But that's a blessing, Mike. It truly is a blessing. Okay, we need to get started. Anybody else? We good? Did any of you... I'm sorry, Mike. Uh, there are some of us going on a little trip in the morning, a little bus trip. If you are going on this bus trip, you need to be here in the church parking lot at quarter to seven at the latest. Okay? Quarter to seven at the latest. David, I didn't see you. It's good to see you. Y'all are back. Glad y'all came. All right? Yeah. Okay, next thing, right quick. Anybody see any miracles this week? Really? All right, this, let me ask you this. We do still believe in miracles, right? Yeah. Okay, well, maybe we need to look at I've seen a lot of works of evil. What? I've seen a lot of works of evil. You know, the preacher was talking about that this morning. Yeah, and you don't have to look far. No. I mean, you can go You can go downtown Petersdown. You don't have to look far to see. He was talking about the end times, and I won't, I won't tell you what he's going to preach about, so you know. <laughs> he was talking about the end times and the works of evil that we see in the world. They're everywhere. I mean, they're everywhere. Stick. Okay. I had a miracle. Good. What was it? My patient passed away without suffering for very long. Amen. Amen. Okay. Good. Good. You know, uh, and I know this sounds crude, really. I mean, it may sound a little rough, but you do understand there's worse things than dying. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and that can be. That was a miracle. Yeah. Good. Good. That can be a blessing. You know, the miracles, they're, they're out there. You know, like he said, you can see the evil bounce around all over the place. Sometimes you got to kind of look for those miracles, but they are there, and we need to pay attention to them. Yes, ma'am? I did see a miracle. Well, I didn't see a miracle. I heard a miracle this week. Okay. I had a patient who was telling me about his very, very, very difficult life, um, and his faith did not waver. He gave all the glory to God for all the good that he's had and that's all the bad. Amen. And it's nice to hear that people don't give up their faith when they go through trials. Good, good. That's a good one. Uh, this is one of your patients. Yeah. Man. Yeah. He's still alive. He is. Yep, he is. 
Okay. He just has a lot, a lot going on right now. Right. Okay. Anybody else? Got anything? All right. Good. Take your Bibles, turn to the book of Nehemiah. Take your Bibles, turn to the book of Nehemiah. Let's pray. Ready? Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful day. We praise you, Lord, and thank you for allowing us to be here. We thank you, Lord, for being able to see these miracles. And we just pray that you help us to pay attention to what we're doing, to be able to see the good, Father, not always look at the bad, to be able to see the good things that you're doing. And we give you the glory for all of us. We pray, Lord, you'd help us now with this Sunday school class. Just lead us. Show us what to do, Father. Help us to learn and understand. Pray that you would work here. Thank you, Father, for saving us. For the forgiveness of our sins, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse number 6. <coughs> Nehemiah chapter 4, verse number 6. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse number 6. Would you stand, please? Book of Nehemiah chapter number 4, verse number 6. Let's read this together. So build we the wall, and all the walls join together unto the half thereof. For the people, people have had a mind to work. work. All right, thank you. You have to see. What we want to think about mind work, what we want to think about there is the people had a mind to work. All right? And we're going to see that here in just a little bit. Back up now to chapter number three. <coughs> chapter number three, our Sunday school lesson is here in chapter number three. And what our Sunday school lesson is about is delegating. Okay? We want to talk about delegating authority and responsibility to other people. And we want to see what the Bible says about that. And what we want to try to understand from this is we want to try to understand how this benefits us. All right? That's what we're going to look at for just a second, how this benefits us. First thing, this is the definition that we want to use. This is what it means to delegate. It means to entrust somebody with a responsibility, with a work, uh, with authority, give them the authority to do this. All right? This is how we're going to approach this. Now, in your Sunday school lesson, and we want to use this definition in your Sunday school lesson, it talks about Nehemiah delegating. Okay? Look at your Bibles for just a minute. And I want to think about this for just a second. We talked about last week, go back up into verse number 18. Verse number 18, this is where Nehemiah is, is trying to encourage, he's trying to motivate these people to work on the wall. All right, we talked about that last week. He tells them, then I, then I told them of the hand of my God that was good upon me, as also the king's word, and also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. Now watch this. And they said, the people said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Now, See right there where it says, let us rise up and build. All right? Now, the next thing that happens is Nehemiah has to deal with these hindrances from Satan that we talked about last week. Sanballat, Tobiah, uh, Geshem, these three men. Now look down in chapter 3, look at verse number 1. Watch what happens. Then Elisha, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priests. All right? Verse 18, they said, let us rise up and build. Chapter 3, verse number 1. Elisha, the high priest, rose up with his brethren. Okay? They got up and they started to work. Now, look at verse number uh, 2. And next unto him built the men of Jericho. Verse number 4. And next unto them repaired Merrimah. Verse number 5. And next unto them the Technoites. Verse number 7. And next unto them. Verse number 8. Next unto him. Alright? Now, Let's stop right here just a minute. There's something here that we want to talk about. Your Sunday school book, and I've got a, I got a problem with it. I've had a problem with this ever since we started into this study of Nehemiah. Your Sunday school book, it seems to me like, gives Nehemiah a lot of credit for doing things that actually the Holy Spirit did. Now, Nehemiah was there, and the Holy Spirit worked through him, but we have to understand it. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. This is not Nehemiah's work. All right? We've talked about that. The Sunday school book says, let me find it here right quick. Uh, for example, your Sunday school book says, Nehemiah assigned responsibilities. It says, Nehemiah organized the workers and delegated work for them. 
It says, Nehemiah delegated work according to the interest of the work. It says, Nehemiah's organizational skills are manifested. All right, now what I'm asking you is, from the scripture that we just looked at, do you see any indication there anywhere that Nehemiah said, you do this, you do this. I want you over here, you go right back here. You work over here. Do you see that in there anywhere? See, I don't really. You know, what I think happened is when these people, if you look back in verse 18, when it says, and they said, let us rise up. Right there, they were convicted by the Holy Spirit. All right? They were motivated by the Holy Spirit. And they said, <laughs> let us rise up. Now, when Elisha, in, in verse number 1, stands up and, and goes to work, he is motivated by the Holy Spirit. He's going right over here and work because that's where the Holy Spirit put him. All right? See the difference there? Okay? Now, we have to be kind of careful here, and it gets to where we, we're we kind of split hairs a little bit, like the preacher said. What we need to understand is, and what we want to think about, is when we're using literature that somebody else is writing, right? this is good stuff. There's, you know, It's this particular part I don't agree with, and it seems to me like they are assuming things that the Bible doesn't say. Okay? That's the problem I have with it. Now, is it possible that Nehemiah said, you go here, you go here, you go here? Of course it's possible. All right? That's not what the Bible says. Okay? We need to make sure that we understand. As if we're looking at Sunday school books, we're looking at commentaries, we're looking at, we're listening to people speak. All right? We got to make sure what the Bible says. Okay? So, you see that there are two, there are two different possibilities there. One was that Nehemiah said, go here, go here, go here. The other is that the Holy Spirit said, go here, go here, go here. Working through Nehemiah. Now, let's talk about us here for just a minute. We're talking about us, all right? Right here, okay? The preacher gets up in the pulpit and he's making the announcements, all right? And he says, announcement, 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 all by the way. We have an activity over in the activity building this afternoon. We're going to need a few people to move some tables. Uh, Jesse, if you don't mind, you and Seth, Caleb, maybe you and Ethan can come over. Corey, you, Mike, Todd, if you come over and help us. It won't take but five or ten minutes. And he keeps right on with the announcements. All right? You got it? Corey, you with me? Okay. Now, the preacher stands up in the pulpit. He's giving the announcements. Announcement, announcement, announcement. And he says, oh, by the way, we got an activity going on in the activity building over here this afternoon. If a few of you men wouldn't mind coming over, it wouldn't take but 10 or 15 minutes if you all will come over by and we'll knock that out. Okay? Now, Corey, see the difference? All right? The difference being, the first go round, he is delegating to you. He just delegated to Corey, to Mike, to Ethan. He delegated that responsibility. I need you over there. All right? Second time around, <clears throat> he turned it over to the Holy Spirit. Okay? He's going to let the Holy Spirit delegate this authority. See the difference? They ain't seen the difference. Okay? Let me ask you something. Dan, which way is better? First of all, is there a better way? Is one better than the other? If so, which one's better? Lord may lead you to delegate in that certain way, but you still will lead you. I see now here, yeah, we're starting, we're going to chase our tails here. This <laughs> Say that one more time. Whichever way the Lord, whichever way the Lord leads you is the best way. Okay, so the best way, boy, well, that's, a, that's a politician, that's a political answer right there. <laughs> so the best way would be however the Lord leads him to do it, right? All right. And I know along with that, but the problem is, Seth, you know, if he stands up here and looks at you and says, look, Seth, I need you to come over and help me with uh, the table, right? You don't feel led to do this. So, are you, do you feel like it, he's pressured? Do you feel pressured? Do you all feel pressured if the preacher comes to you, Kelly, and says, look, I need you to do such and such? Like, you know, I don't want to hurt his feelings. I don't want, I want to do whatever it is he wants me to do. Do you feel that kind of pressure to do those things? Kelly, would you? Because he asked you. 
Okay? So he comes to you and says, look, Kelly, I want you to go stand down on the corner and hand out my tracks. I would like you to be there next Thursday. Right? Now, do you feel like the Holy Spirit has led you to go stand on the corner and hand out my tracks? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> praise the Lord, you know. If he did, fine. Corey, you're sitting there thinking, oh, you know, I want to help. I'm willing to help. Okay? But I can't do it today. I got something I got to do. It just so happens that after church, I got someplace I have to be. You know? Any other time, I'd be glad to do it. So, this, do you feel bad now? Uh, do you feel like you're letting him down because you're saying, I just, I just can't do it today? What's that mean? Yes. Oh. Yeah. You feel like you would be letting him down? Yes. Should he feel like that? Well, my honest personal opinion is like, if I ask somebody to do something and <clears throat> they can't do it at that time, uh, my personal belief is, you know, if it was something the Lord led me to do or led me to ask somebody, and they said, well, I really don't think I can right now, well, that means the timing wasn't right for that person, and God obviously will raise somebody else up to accomplish the task. And I think it ties in a little bit to what you're saying with this Nehemiah thing. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think, and I don't think we need to get this in our mind that, like, I think these people were led by the Holy Spirit, uh, kind of like what you're saying, but they just didn't show up and then start doing these particular jobs because that's what the Holy Spirit told them. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like if I say, hey, I've got a project over in the activity building. Here's what needs done. Boom, 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 boom. And then leave it to the Holy Spirit. I think that's kind of what's going on here in Nehemiah. Nehemiah, there was a plan of action God gave him, but... It was the Lord who put this on people's hearts and started directing everything. I think it was kind of a combination of both. I don't think it was just one way or the other. All right. All right. <clears throat> Let's think about this for just a minute. Now, first of all, let me tell you something. This is personal. Something that aggravates me to death, that really aggravates a far out of me, is when I look at somebody and say, would you mind? And if they don't want to, all they have to do is say, no, they can't do that. Right? I'm good. I've got no problem with that. Yeah. What aggravates me is when somebody will look at me and say, well, you know, maybe I might, let me think, I'll probably, you know, let me see what I can do. All you got to do is say, I'm going to do it. <laughs> Simple as that. Okay? Yeah, I wouldn't want somebody doing something because they felt pressured. Right, there you go. Now, when you, when, you, when you look at this delegation, first of all, let's look at who benefits. Okay? Who does this help? First of all, if he delegates, it helps him. Okay? You, you know that. That will give him, he can delegate something to me or to you or to somebody else. That frees up his time. Okay? Now he can go work on more important things or other things that he needs to do. Also, it helps the people who are the subject of this delegation. It helps the work. Right? You know, if, if he has to set them tables up over there, it honestly, it might get done in my mind. Right? He's got a lot to do. He'll get to it if he can get to it. All of a sudden, here this event is, he got no tables. He's been dealing with somebody over here getting saved. Okay? So if he delegates, it benefits the work. Okay? The receivers, the work. Alright? Now, next question. So we got, you understand what we're talking about when we talk about delegating. The next thing we need to figure out here is, is the scripture for this? Is this something that God says, here, you're supposed to do this? Are we, can we chapter and verse it? All right, that's what we're talking about. Now, take your Bibles, go to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus, we've got several Bible verses here to look at. The book of Exodus, we're in chapter number 18, verse number 13. The book of Exodus, chapter 18, <coughs> verse number 13. You all right? Uh, 18, verse number 13. Let me tell you what's going on here right quick. Moses has led... The children of Israel out of Egypt. Okay? Uh, the plagues have happened. He has led them out of Egypt. They've crossed the Red Sea. They're in the wilderness. That's what's going on. That's where they are right now. Jethro, who is Moses' father in law, brings Moses' wife, Zipporah, and their two kids to meet Moses so they can, tr- so they can be with him, so their family can be together. That's what's happened. They show up. Jethro shows up, has the wife and kids, they all pat each other on the back, everybody's fine, they fellowship, they have a big meal, they all go to bed. All right? What happens, what we're going to look at is what happens the next morning.
Okay, look at verse number 13. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said to judge the people, and the people stood by Moses from the morning unto the evening. All right? These people, Moses goes out at daylight, sets down, these people come before him two, three, four at a time with whatever issue they have, and he judges from God's law to these people. Here's what we need to do. Okay, that's what's happened. Now, look at what his father-in-law says. Verse number 14, And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, What is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone, and all the people stand by thee from morning unto evening? Right? Moses is sitting out there all day. These people are lined up as far as you can see, and he's by himself, and he's judging one group at a time all day long. Okay? Now, here comes the important part. Look at verse number 17. Now, this is Moses' father-in-law talking to the man who just led the children of Israel out of Egypt, right? Went through the, the whole system of plagues, had the staff, <laughs> over a million people. He leads them out of Egypt, across the Red Sea, and his father-in-law looks at him and said, The thing that thou doest is not good. Right? Jethro looks around and said, It's no good, son. Right? This is not going to work. You need to fix this. Okay? The reason why it is not going to work, look at verse number 18. Thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee, thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Jethro, his, his father on the side, he says, this thing's going to work. Right? You can't manage this. You're, this, is, it, this is, it's bad and it's not going to be effective. You simply can't do it. It's not good for you, and it's certainly not good for the people. Right? Now look what he tells him to do. Verse number 19. Hearken unto my words, and I will give thee counsel. Now this is important. And God shall be with thee. Right? Jethro tells him, if you'll do what I'm telling you, God will be with you. Okay? Be thou for the people to God, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God, and thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt show them the way wherein that they must walk, the work they must do. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, hating covenants, and we can stop right here. Right, right here's chapter and verse for delegating. Okay? Right there is scripture for it. It's supposed to be done. Jethro tells us, if you'll do this, God will be with you. Okay? Now, look down at verse number 22. And let them judge the people at all seasons. That is, these men who Moses has taught. Verse number 23. If thou shalt so do this, if thou shalt do this thing, and God commanded thee so, if thou shalt do this thing, and God commanded thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure. And all this people shall go also to their place in peace. But Jethro looks at him and says, look, if you just do what I'm telling you, God will be with you. And by the way, God commands you to do this. You will be able to make it. You will be able to endure it. And the people shall go their way in peace. All right? Just like we were talking about the preacher benefits from delegating, the work gets done. All right? That's the same thing that Jethro is telling Moses. You will benefit from this. You'll be able to endure it. And the people all right, shall be able to go their way in peace. Okay? Now, so we got chapter and verse for delegate. Alright? And we see who benefits from it. Now there's one more thing right there that is really important, really. We're going to talk about it in just a second. Okay? Take your Bibles, turn to the book of Acts. Turn to the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, chapter number six. The book of Acts, chapter number six. Now, while you're looking, let me tell you what's happening here. Pentecost has just happened. It's the apostles are working on building this new church. They are preaching, they are teaching, they are evangelizing, they are praying, they are fasting, they are visiting. All right? And they're, they're working on this all day, every day. In chapter 6, if you look back up chapter 5, verse number 42, it says, And daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus. Now what happens is they, these guys are working hard at this. Right? Now, there are a group of people in their congregation, who are the Grecians, who are troubled because the widows in the congregation are not being taken care of. Right? That's the problem. So what they do is they go to these apostles and they say, look, we've got this up here. Right? These, we're, we're neglecting these widows. This has to be fixed. 
The apostles say, okay, what you need to do is go and pick out seven good men among you. They can work on this work, and we can stay focused on what we're doing. Right there's chapter and verse for delegate. That's what they're getting ready to do, is delegate. Okay? So what happens is, Verse number 3, chapter 6, verse number 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Got it? Okay? The people who benefit, the apostles, they can stay focused on the work that they're doing. The work gets done. The widows benefit, because now this work will be done in a timely manner by men full of the Holy Ghost. Okay? There's chapter and verse for delegate. Now, you're still... Something else right there we've got to come back to that's really important. Alright? Now, take your Bibles, turn to the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew, chapter number 10. The book of Matthew, chapter number 10. What's happening here is Jesus Christ is getting ready to send the 12 disciples out two by two to preach, heal, and teach. Okay? That's where we're at. It says... In verse number 5, chapter 10, verse number 5, these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, right there, he delegated. He is delegating this work to these 12 apostles. He's going to send them out two by two, 12 disciples, all right? And verse number 8, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely ye have received, freely give, all right? So, who benefits from this? Jesus Christ benefits from this. His name will be glorified throughout the land as these men travel and heal and preach and teach. So he benefits, right? The people who benefit on the other end are the people who are healed, right? Cleansed, that are taught, okay? If they had to wait for Jesus to actually get there to do this, it may not get done. So he delegated this to those people, okay? Now, Here's where we are. We got chapter and verse for this. We got scripture. Yes, you're supposed to delegate. Yes, God will be with you. Yes, God commands you to do it. It has to be done. Okay? Now, here's the important part. We went through all this so we could talk about this. Here's the most important part about delegating responsibility and authority to someone. First thing that we have to remember is, and I read this somewhere this week, a potential leader will, ne- will, will always be just a potential leader if no authority or responsibility is delegated to him. Right? He'll never grow. Okay? Now, we want to think about that and we want to look at, we want to look at what happens here. Take your Bibles, go to the book of Mark. Book of Mark, chapter number 6, verse number 7. Book of Mark. Chapter number six, verse number seven. This is the same story to the different book, right? Jesus Christ is delegating to these disciples. Now watch this. Here we go. Okay? It says in verse number seven, And he called unto them the twelve, and began to send them forth two by two, and gave them power. You see that? He gave them power. Now, what we need to understand and what we need to get from all of this, the most important thing, the, the group of people who will benefit the most from this delegation is the people to whom this work is delegated to. That's who benefits the most. These apostles right here, these disciples, Jesus Christ gave them power. They went out into the world and preached and teach. He gave them an opportunity to come closer to God. All right? And that's what happens when this authority is delegated. When we were talking about Moses a minute ago in the book of Exodus, the people who benefited the most from that whole operation were the people that Moses selected, the men that he selected to teach. Those are the people who benefited from it most of all because they were given an opportunity to serve. They were given an opportunity to come closer to God. When, we, when you look at what uh, the apostles did with those seven men in the book of Acts, those seven men benefited more than anybody else in that whole, in that whole idea. 
two of those men went on to become great evangelists. Philip and uh, Stephen, they were given power through the Holy Spirit to do this work. In the book of Exodus, those men were given power through the Holy Spirit to do this work. They are the ones that benefit. Okay? They are going to grow. They are going to become more spiritually mature because of this work. Right? That's what we that's what we have to understand. And when we think about this, and then we begin to think, okay, how does this work for me? Right? Now, if the preacher says, Todd, I need you to come over and move these tables after after church, right? And you say, Okay, I'll go go. You are the guy that benefits from it. Not the preacher does. The tables get moved. But the people who do the work are the people who benefit the most because they are given the power of the Holy Spirit to do the work and they become convicted to do it and they become closer to God. We become closer to God because of our service. Okay? Uh, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't make any difference what it is that we are delegated to do. You know, when you look at you and I, see, if you look around, look around at me. Okay, turn around and look around at those people around. See? Right? We are not going to delegate authority. We have no authority to delegate. Okay? In our church, the way things are set up here, the preacher is going to delegate. The deacons are going to delegate. The Sunday school superintendent is going to delegate. We are the people who these things are going to be delegated to, and we are going to benefit the most from them. We are going to receive the blessings because we decide to do the work. See, that puts us right back. That puts us right back to where we started with our service. Now we know what to do. The Holy Spirit says, Seth, I need you to go over and help some things. Okay? Now we know what to do. We understand the conviction. We understand that we're being called. We have to understand the blessing and the privilege and the honor that it is to have this work delegated to us. You remember we talked about last week the fact that this is the most important work we'll ever do? Remember that? The work that we do for God, even if all it is is setting up tables, is the most important work we will ever do. Okay? we got to remember that. Now, one last thing. Here's where we're going to finish. When Jesus Christ left this world, all right, stay with me here, all right, when Jesus, when Jesus Christ left this world, he delegated to me a tremendous responsibility. Sure. Okay? And it's exactly, that's exactly what we're talking about. He delegated this work to me. Alright? He'll benefit from it. His name will be glorified through it. The people who are on the receiving end of this work will benefit from it. They may actually get led to the Lord. Alright? But the true beneficiary is me. Okay? Because he delegated this work to me. Take your Bibles, turn to the book of Matthew. Book of Matthew, chapter number 28. Book of Matthew, chapter number 28, verse number 18. Book of Matthew, chapter number 28, verse number 18. It says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now, here it comes. All right? Here is Jesus Christ delegating to me. He says, Go ye therefore and teach. Right? There it is. That's not rocket science. Okay? That's not hard to understand. Jesus Christ left me with this responsibility. He delegated this responsibility to me. And what I have to understand is that by fulfilling this work, I'm the guy that's going to be blessed because of it. Right? The honor, the privilege that we have to, to do this work Okay? And the blessing and rewards that we will receive from it. And it is our responsibility. He, dele- he delegated it to us, expecting it to be done. Okay? How's Charlotte doing back there, Bethany? <laughs> Actually, I think she is. She sounds like she is. Okay, we're done. That didn't take too awful long, I don't think. Let's talk about this just a second. Tell me what you think about this, about this delegation. Alright? Uh, so, Corey, if the preacher comes to you and wants you to do something, you're going to try to do it simply so you don't hurt his feelings. 
I'm going to tell you, and I do agree with you, but the reason I don't delegate is my, <clears throat> I'm not a micromanager by any stretch of imagination, but I want to do like 2 Timothy 2.2 2 says, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. I want to know the people I'm going to delegate to are going to do the work with the same heart, same passion, same energy that I'm going to put into it and let the Lord lead them at that point. So I want to make sure that before I turn over some responsibility to somebody, that that's going to be there. So if I ask you to do something, it's kind of like when we were talking about you teaching the Sunday school class. Now, I prayed about that for like two years. And <clears throat> and the Lord kept putting you on my heart. I'm going to talk to Dave about that. And I think you've done a great job with the energy, the passion, everything. I would, And that's relieved me of a tremendous responsibility. Yeah, but see, yeah, yeah I understand. And I'm, and see, now, let, now let, me, let me translate. Let me put this in language terms. He's not going to ask you because he don't think you can do it as well as he can. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. That's true. But I have, I have to also feel that this is something my father-in-law told me a long time ago when it comes to delegating, and this is what happens too many times with leaders, you delegate your responsibility in a way that really is your responsibility to make sure it gets done. And what happens is you do it too soon and too quickly, and the thing ends up falling apart because it wasn't Holy Spirit-led. That is also where the caution comes in on my part. I want to make sure that when I'm going to delegate something, and it doesn't matter what it is. You know, It's like even when Rodney started coming and we were talking about things and he wanted to get more involved in the church, I was telling Rodney, I said, well, this is a big help. And he turned on all the lights in the building, got everything up and going. And he didn't feel like that maybe at the time was a big deal, but that was a big deal to me, and that was a huge help to me. And that was a huge assistant. Uh, and then, too, I felt like, you know, this is exactly what God wants. It wasn't just anybody. I knew he would do it. He would do a good job with it. Uh, so it's just stuff like that. And that's I just want to make sure I'm not going to turn it over to somebody who's going to just be flippant with it. That's right. a big thing. You know, if you're, if, you're going to, if you're going to delegate these things, you have to, you have to be, I guess, selective. And, and the main thing, and see, this goes back to what we were talking about with Nehemiah. The main, the main thing is we need to be Holy Spirit led. Yeah. Right. When we do these things, for example, if I came to you and said, "Look, how about you teach Sunday school for me next Sunday? I'm not going to be here. I'm talking to you." Right. Yeah. Yeah. See, there we are. Okay. That's not going to work. That's, you know, so you have to pay attention to who you're delegating to. Now, there's a certain responsibility there. Because, you know, when you think about it, see, the preacher and the deacons and the Sunday school superintendent de delegated the responsibility of this Sunday school class to me. That means I'm responsible for it. Okay? That's what that means to me. That means if I can't be here, I don't go to the preacher. No, I'm not going to be here. You need to find somebody else. This Sunday school class is my responsibility. It's my responsibility to find somebody to be here if I'm not going to be here, which Corey's done, and, and I thank him a lot more. Uh, so anyway, it's just something that we need to pay attention to. And we need to understand, like he said, there's no little job. Right? If he says, you know, Dave, you and my want to talk about this. A few pieces of trash out there that didn't pick up. I'm working for God here. Sure. Okay? It doesn't matter that all I'm doing is picking up a few pieces of trash. Okay? Anything else? Anybody? Next Sunday's Easter Sunday. Don't forget, Easter Sunday is all about what Jesus Christ came to do. Right? Christmas is about who he is. Easter is about what he came to do. Okay? Anything else? Yes, sir? I think different individuals have different 
level of a servant's heart. When it comes to being delegated or whatever, some people, like you were talking about, don't want to be bothered with because they got stuff going on that they need to dedicate that time to their projects instead of what the preachers want done at the church. Somebody that has more of a servant's heart, a giving heart, is more apt to take on the appointment of the church being delegated. All right, boys, just stop right there. How many of you were here the other night when the preacher was talking about being spirit filled? Okay, that's what he's talking about. That's what CA is talking about. We like you know you sit here this morning and you say, okay, I'm 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 not completely spirit filled. I can tell you right now, I'm not completely spirit filled. Well, the degree to which we are filled with the spirit is directly related to our serve our heart as how we serve. Okay, you know if I'm just very partially filled with the Spirit. The preacher sends me a text says, Dave, I need you to go to the nursing home. I say, nah, I ain't got nothing to do. I got something else to do. Right? Whereas if I am Spirit filled, like he's talking about, then this service comes a lot quicker and easier. And we, we, we do more of it, try to do more of it. Right? Yeah. And part of what he's saying too with the servant's heart, you know, the spiritual gift of a servant, that is one of the spiritual gifts, but a misuse of that gift is they can't tell people no. And that's another thing I'm careful with. When I know, when I see people around and I see it, that's their spiritual gift, they're a servant. Like Becky, she's that way. She has a hard time telling people no. And there's a few others I see in the church that are, they have the gift of servant. Yeah, she just told me no. They're pretty good. Well, I've had, to, I've had to teach her to do that. She's had to learn to do that. But it's like, it's hard for that person with that spiritual gift to say no because they have such a servant's heart. But that's where, too, God puts somebody in their life to protect them for that thing. So I try to be careful asking certain people to do things because I know they'll do it. Anything I ask them. Yeah, they feel, they feel the, the yeah. pressure towards them. Right. feel like they need to because you're asking. All right. Yes, ma'am. I do think it's also, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong, um, just to maybe ease the guilt that people may feel saying no to the preacher is to remember that maybe what you're doing outside of the church is what the Lord is leading you to do, maybe in some way that's going to benefit you or benefit somebody else, even if it's not like directly something that the preacher's asking you. Does that right. make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you're, you, you're, you're doing God's work and you're working and you feel like you're working in what the Holy Spirit has led you and He's pointing you to go in a different direction. Yeah, like don't some, feel guilty for saying yeah, that. Uh, 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 the main thing, this is the hard part, we all know that is being in the will of God and paying attention to right. what the Holy yes. Spirit tells us to do. That's where I want to be. Right. And I want the Holy Spirit right here saying, here, do this. No, 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 don't do that. Do this. Okay? Which is where we're down the street. You know, you cannot be, remember the boldness? Sometimes you just got to say no. Yeah? Somebody comes up with something to speak and you say, well, that's wonderful, but no, I'm not going to do that. Right? That's just the way you have to handle it. Okay? Anybody else? We good? Okay. Seth, you mind praying? We'll be done. And everybody, <coughs> thank you for the opportunity to come to your house and everybody to serve you and learn your word and learn your book. And everybody, we're thankful for the, for, the, uh, for the message. I pray that it gets all of our hearts and gets, uh, it makes us better Christians and better soldiers for you as we, as we soldier on through, through the work week and um, and shine, let our light shine before, before other men. Ask for your wisdom and guidance and protection through our next service. We ask this your high name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. Amen. Amen.